Hey folks, thank you for coming, really appreciate that. I hope you all had a good lunch. Um, I'm Hitesh Sharma, I'm a Principal Engineering Manager in the Big Data team at Microsoft and uh, today Anupam and I are here to talk about Graphene, which is the next generation of the Scope Application Master building on this. So to get things started, I'll give you folks a very quick overview of what is Cosmos, what is Scope, what is the Job Manager, what responsibilities it has in our system. I'll also talk about some of the problems that we currently have, which we are looking to solve in Graphene by leveraging this. I'll then hand it to Anupam, who will go in deeper design and implementation details of Graphene. He'll also talk about some of the big rocks in front of us, where we need your help in scaling this to that next level. So what is Cosmos? At a very simple level, Cosmos is a big data platform for Microsoft. This is a place where Office, Azure, Bing, and different Microsoft Teams pump the data in and use it for their analytical needs. Cosmos is also available externally as Azure Data Lake Analytics. And uh, the real promise of Cosmos is that here you let customers focus on analyzing the data while behind the scenes as a platform we take care of scaling it out and ensuring it's running reliably with lower cogs. So Cosmos also so Cosmos also happens to be the largest YARN cluster in the world. This is a journey we started on a few years ago and are very well in the last leg of it. And here are some numbers. The largest YARN cluster that we today have has more than 40,000 machines and uh, we have many such clusters spanning different data centers. We run more than half a million jobs a day and are requesting more than 3 billion containers from YARN. So we are already pushing YARN to levels that nobody else has. To ensure that our cogs remain low, we run the servers at a good utilization. We offer our customers three nines of availability. Exabytes of data are stored in Cosmos and petabytes of data are processed daily. If you want to learn more, you should attend a talk from our team on Thursday about Yarn Federation and the next steps and challenges in that space. So what is scope? Scope is pretty much the scripting language for Cosmos. This is a main analytical workload that is running on our clusters today. Like I mentioned, we have been in the journey of upgrading Cosmos to Yarn, and we are now seeing other workloads like Spark mushrooming in different clusters, but Scope continues to be the main one for us. And uh, Scope is influenced by SQL, works very well with C-sharp and .NET, and is very extensible. So if you have uh, your favorite .NET library that you want to use in a reducer, processor, operator, you can easily do that. And on the screen, I have a sample Hello World scope script where you can see you can load some data, run the extractor of your choice to load the data, then run a select query. You also have an as clause in there where we are actually using a C sharp statement, which is using the string methods from the .NET library and uh, outputting the data back to the Cosmos. The reason Cosmos has been very successful within Microsoft is primarily because it, we just make it work. So as a user, you come in and you write a job and you run it on one terabyte, 10 terabyte, 100 terabyte, or even a petabyte and it just works. Behind the scenes, we make sure we parallelize it efficiently. We deal with failures and we keep the cogs low by ensuring our servers are well utilized. And that really lowers the barrier for people to do large scale data mining and those sorts of operations. So moving on, I'll quickly walk you at a very high level on um, how users interact with Scope and Cosmos, what their experience is like, and what be happens behind the scenes when you submit a Scope job to Cosmos. Typically, most users submit a job in Cosmos using Scope Studio, which is our Visual Studio plugin. It goes through the front end and the job service and thereby makes it to the Scope compiler, where it gets compiled on the cluster. The compiler produces an abstract syntax tree or an AST along with other artifacts required to execute the job. This then makes its way to the optimizer which is responsible for producing an efficient DAG execution plan that also specifies the parallelism that should be used for different stages. The optimizer also produces something called the algebra which is the main input to the job manager which is us. The job manager's main responsibility is to take the compile time representation given by the optimizer and the compiler for the DAG and start executing on the cluster. 
And to do that, Job Manager launches the scope engine on the cluster nodes. And when it does that, it would typically tell the scope engine that, hey, here is the data that you need to be processing. And please write back the data over at this location. And also, here are the operators that you want to be running on this particular chunk of data. And scope engine is where all the implementation for different operators are actually done. And when scope engine finishes running, it produces new data, and the job manager says, OK, I have new data input. Let me go look at the DAG and see which vertices or tasks we're waiting for these inputs and start executing them next. And the process continues. Now, along the way, the users can also see the progress of their job uh, through the Scope Studio tooling that we have. They can see how far the job has progressed, how many tasks have been run, are there any failures, how much data was read and written, and so on. So I shared some numbers for Cosmos earlier, but here are some numbers that are representative of the largest jobs that we are running in our clusters today. Some of the Cosmos jobs can consume more than one petabyte of data. They run at a very high concurrency of 15,000 tasks, which means you are actually processing events coming from all these concurrent tasks that are running across the cluster and have to do that in a very real-time manner so DAG execution can continue in the most optimal way. There can be thousands of vertices, and the DAG can be very wide, very deep, or both. The jobs typically have millions of tasks during the lifetime, which translates into billions of edges, which puts a lot of memory pressure, like uh, the job manager becomes memory extensive in those cases. So clearly, if we have to use stays and uh, have graphene go run at this scale, we will need your support. So I'll dig uh, a bit into the job manager, what it does, and what are the responsibilities really quickly. So job manager has been around for almost a decade, ever since the Dryart paper came from Microsoft Research. And the core responsibility really is to execute a DAG given by the optimizer. And to do so, the job manager goes and traverses it topologically, builds a graph, and starts executing it on the cluster. And to do to do so, it will start the vertices whose inputs are available. So typically, those are your extract stages that run first, and thereafter, some other stage that was waiting for those inputs to be present will start executing. So on the right, I have a quick example where we're reading some data, extracting it out, running some aggregates, combining it, and then doing a final aggregation before outputting. The job manager can also do some dynamic DAG updates. So for instance, if it sees there's a lot of rack local data being pro produced, it will probably insert a, a rack level aggregation to prevent cross-rack traffic. And similarly, if it sees the same copy of data is being read multiple times by thousands of downstream vertices, it will go do a broadcast tree, which will make some replicas of the data and increase the reliability at which the job executes. Now, as we are executing all these millions of tasks in the DAG, we also will have failures, and that's another thing the job manager handles. It's supposed to retry system and user's error appropriately. If there are any outliers whereby a stage has some tasks that are running a lot slower than other, it will go restart them and see if they run faster or catch up. And if a task complains that I cannot read my inputs, it will go and uh, re-execute the parent task responsible for producing those inputs and then restart the initially failing task to say, hey, OK, here are the new inputs. Please go run again. Another very interesting aspect of the job manager is the scheduling. Now, once it knows that some task can be executed, the job manager goes and figures out, like, from my tens and thousands of machines in the cluster, which machine is the most optimal to execute the DAG or that particular task upon. And to do so, it uses what we call the Apollo scheduler. Apollo is a scheduler distributed in every job manager running in the cluster. And it uses some auxiliary services in our cluster, like resource monitor and process node, to build a view of the load in the cluster. So using that extra information that's available, the job managers decide which machines are most optimal for running the given task. And once it makes a determination, it goes and asks that machine from YANRM, and we proceed. The another thing that job manager does is, is to use the spare capacity in the cluster or the use opportunistic containers from YARN to execute the DAG. Because your clusters are not always going to be utilized, and in those scenarios, bonus tokens, as we call it, or opportunistic containers come in very handy. 
So on this graph over here, you can see it represents the resource utilization of different stages or vertices in the graph. And the horizontal black line is showing the limit with which the job was supposed to run. But we can see many stages actually went above that limit. And the reason is they were using the spare capacity in form of opportunistic containers from Yarn to do so. As we have progressed in our journey to upgrade Yarn or upgrade Cosmos to Yarn, we have learned that the pressure, the kind of load that we are putting on Yarn is extensive. Like I mentioned earlier, we are requesting more than 3 billion containers a day. And to mitigate that to some extent, we have implemented more recently the container reuse feature in the job manager, whereby instead of requesting a container repeatedly over and over, we actually try to use it a few times and then give it back or throw it away. What we learned is that it's actually tricky when you have uh, one goal is to utilize the cluster capacity by using opportunistic containers, and then another goal is to actually reuse as much as possible because now there are simply more options that the job manager has to decide between. Like, if a token is there, should I actually go upgrade a low priority container to high priority container, or should I actually go just reuse it or get a guaranteed container? One other thing that the job manager does is, is finalization. As the DAG nears to completion and all the outputs are present, the job manager will call the store and update the metadata to finalize the outputs, which make it visible to the end user. And we also will call our catalog service and do similar updates there. Now, when we are running more than half a million jobs per day, we will have failures, and it's very important for us to be able to diagnose them quickly and uh, let our DRIs know what's happening, or let the customers know what's going on behind the scenes with the job. So for doing that, the job manager actually emits various and collects a lot of information and emits it back to our reporting pipeline and as such. So for instance, over here I have a screenshot of our DAG execution, and you can see for various stages, a lot of data is actually shared, like how many tasks were there, how much data was read and written. And all that data is actually persisted in our pipelines, whereby we can actually replay it. So we can actually know exactly what happened with the job when it was running in the cluster. The job manager also supports something we call the critical path, which tells us which stage or which sequence of stages likely contributed to the runtime the most. And again, because we have it's a distributed system. We will have failures, and failures may be because of store, user error, or yarn. And that's, again, another thing that the job manager supports. It actually goes and produces a very structured JSON, which lets our upstream pipelines figure out what went wrong in the job, where the error errors came from, and so on. So that's all under the purview of the responsibilities that the job manager has. So what are the challenges that we have today with the job manager? Like I mentioned, it's been there for a decade. The code has grown a lot organically and uh, has had some surgeries done on it, which has made the cost of ownership for us higher when it comes to adding newer and bigger features. For instance, one of the most requested features from our customers today is JM resiliency or AM recovery. What that means is if the job manager dies somewhere in the cluster and we restart it elsewhere, then it should be able to continue DAG execution from where it was previously. Uh, we are. Though we are a YARN application, we are still tied to Cosmos infrastructure. We cannot just take the job manager and re-execute it on some native YARN cluster anywhere else. There are some auxiliary services, which I briefly touched upon, that need to be present. And um, as the customers and as the data grows, people want to run bigger and bigger jobs. New workloads are showing up where we are learning that having billions of edges or millions of tasks in the vertices and storing lot of metadata when you're processing petabytes of data is actually very memory inefficient and we need to go rethink and see how can we mitigate and solve those problems for the future. And then we don't have native support for interactive workloads. So some of these challenges actually led us to consider, okay, what are the options on the table? And we looked at rewriting, refactoring, and for various reasons, those were not applicable. And then we decided to go investigate these and look into these and see how we can leverage that. This has common roots with the uh, Dryad. It's the same implementation. And we found a lot of commonalities and similarities, which made it pretty easy for us to get started. So where we are, um, like I mentioned, late 2017, we did a quick prototype to see how things can be made to work with this. And then 2018, earlier this year, we ran our benchmark TPCH and TPCDS jobs and saw comparable performance. 
Uh, right now, we are at a stage where we have started to do some offline flighting of our jobs. We have some initial implementation built on Thais that we are now running on the cluster and stabilizing it and finding as many issues as we can. And uh, late this year, we are hoping to complete the first production deployment of graphene on our clusters. Uh, this will not be running at the full scale that I talked about earlier. This is more selective customers where the load or scale may not be as big. Now with that, uh, I'll hand it to Anupam who will take you further in the design and implementation of graphene. Thank you, Itesh. So um, now I'll take you all through uh, some of the design and implementation details of graphene on Thais. I'll also talk about um, some of the opportunities and challenges that we see in the near future and uh, some of the ways we have looked at these in the past and what can we do in the future. But first, let's go through the guiding principles behind the design decisions and choices. So once we decided that we are going to uh, replace job manager with graphene, which will be built as Thais in the core, we decided to set some ground rules of how we will go about doing this. So the first decision was to make minimal changes in the existing scope stack. Uh, this was more of an engineering decision to be able to, uh, to, be able to do this major uh, surgery in the system to be able to replace the job manager with something uh, which is alien to our system currently. So we decided that we'll make minimal possible changes in the compiler, the optimizer, the scope engine, um, which is the physical operator implementations, the storage stack, and the tooling. So those will have minimal changes. So one of the reasons why we chose to go with Thais was the amazing extensibility story and um, the APIs that Thais provides for um, many applications to be built on top of Thais. Uh, and because both Thais and the job manager have their foundations in Riot, this was also a very good choice for us. So we decided that we'll be using the existing Thais extensibility story as far as possible. And working with communities. So it was a very conscious choice for us that from the beginning of this project, we'll be working closely with the community to be able to understand the existing design philosophy for Thais, uh, to be in alignment with that. And whenever we need a feature in Thais uh, that, uh, okay, sorry. Uh, whenever we need a feature in Thais, um, that doesn't exist, we'll work closely with the community and figure out how we can do this in a manner that everyone can leverage. And very importantly, maintain compatibility. So Cosmos, as Hitesh showed you with the numbers, is a very big system, and it runs a lot of mission-critical workloads, uh, analytics workloads for Cosmos for almost every division in Cosmos, uh, in Microsoft. So we had to maintain compatibility in not only the semantics of a job, we also had to maintain compatibility in performance, cost, and extremely importantly, the user experience. The set of tooling that we have built, uh, our users have taken deep dependency on that, and they have come to love that over many years. So we had to make sure that these experiences are at least at parity or better. So graphene in Cosmos has primarily four integration points where Thais interacts with the rest of the system. First is the algebra. Algebra is the um, physical plan that our optimizer produces. Uh, it's our own internal format. And we need to consume this information and be able to generate the DAG representation that Thais can consume and be able to execute the job. Next is the store layer. Um, graphene or Thais needs to be able to interact with the store layer and gather all the metadata that it needs to be able to process the job and statistics when needed. Uh, tooling. So 
we need to produce uh, the debugging details, the execution status, the real-time updates, and even the error details align with what the existing tooling uh, expects. So that is also a place where uh, Graphene or our Thase AM needs to interact with the system. And Scope Engine. Scope Engine is the uh, physical operator implementation for us. It is also the host for user code, um, for user-defined aggregates and functions, et cetera. So Graphene needs to be able to launch Scope Engine, be able to communicate with it, be able to look at the status and statistics from it, and surface that to the user. So taking a deeper look at what a Graphene application master looks like. So when we start up, we enter our own entry point in the application master, Graphene DAG App Master, which takes the algebra produced by our optimizer and sends it to a DAG converter. And here, we use the Thase uh, APIs for input initializers. And wherever the uh, stock edges, connectors provided by Thase, uh, for instance, shuffle, broadcast, and one-to-one -one don't work for us, for our semantics that our algebra is expressing, uh, we use the extensibility of custom edge managers and vertex managers. Uh, and along with all of this, we are able to convert the algebra to the Thay's representation of a DAG. Once this representation of DAG is generated, we give it to Thay's, and thereafter, Thay's does its own magic and runs all the tasks in the job. Taking a deeper look, um, at what happens in this task execution. So once the Graphene application master decides that it needs to run a task, it will go and acquire a container from Yarn and launch the container. What runs inside the container is a scope task. So the scope task has primarily three components in it, the scope processor, the scope input, and the scope output. These are basically logical representation of what needs to happen inside the task. The scope processor is basically, it encodes the information that, um, has, th that has the information what needs to be processed in this particular task. The scope input and output basically encode what input needs to be consumed and what output needs to be produced. So Thay sends its events to the scope task, which gives the scope task enough information. And after that, we would launch the scope engine, again, which has the actual implementation of how to do the data processing, how to do the input, and how to do the output. And we send it a task command, which is basically the context which has all these information encoded. For example, which vertex does this task belong to, or which partition am I processing for, what are the URLs of the input, and what are the URLs of the output, etc. Once the engine does its processing, it will send the status back to the task, or in case there is an error, it will send the details back to the task. And these are then sent as Thay's events back to the Thay's AM for it to continue processing the DAG as Thay's decides. Um, Again, tooling is a very important uh, feature for us. And for this, we had to build a special pipeline here because Scope Engine keeps producing periodic stats and diagnostics. And we route this to the Graphene AM. And right now, we are smuggling this in the uh, task heartbeat. So this is a place where we might look into uh, adding extensibility in Thase itself so that application can add their own rich statistics and diagnostic if they need to. Um, so once the statistics and diagnostic reaches the Thase application master, we have this component called job profiler, which is basically an event listener, which is listening to the relevant uh, Thase events. And it gets the task level statistics, and once many tasks have executed for the vertex, it will get the vertex level aggregated statistics as well. And these statistics are then pr um, pushed to our real-time stat server and historic stat server in the format that our tooling 
expects. So, so far working with Tay is what has been our experience. So, in one word, it has been great. Um, the reliability is exactly what you would expect from a production-ready software. Um, we have hit no major bugs or issues in Taze itself. We have had lots of our own bugs, but we could always rely on Taze doing the right thing. Uh, onboarding, the code was pretty easy to um, understand, modular, well-tested. Uh, the documentation was a bit scanty, but I guess that's an opportunity for us to contribute. And the community has been really amazing for us uh, whenever we have reached out um, to ask any question, uh, get some suggestions. The community has been really forthcoming. And a special thanks to um, Bikas, uh, Kuhu, and Jonathan, who have helped us a lot through this process uh, whenever we have reached out to them. So going forward, what are the major challenges that we see in getting, upgrading all of our scope users on Thais, and what are the areas where we can improve Thais and bring our own experiences from running Cosmos and Scope? So first is scaling Thais. Um, already existing Cosmos workloads can have more than 15,000 concurrent tasks, as Hitesh already told you. Just acquiring and managing this number of containers for a single application master, being able to process all the events coming from these tasks and being able to generate events for the subsequent tasks, and also providing um, the real-time progress that we need to provide for driving our tooling systems, it can just overwhelm the application master. So this is going to be one of the places where we are going to concentrate a lot, and uh, we also expect this to be of general applicability for all users for this. Uh, next, next is optimizing application master memory. So um, for especially large uh, DAGs, which, are either, which either have too many vertices or have a lot of tasks to be run, the application master memory management itself could become a problem, or managing large number of inputs that a particular uh, job has to read, just managing the metadata in memory uh, becomes a big problem. So this is another area where we are going to um, focus, uh, optimizing some of the data structure, optimizing the way they are represented in memory, uh, and also thinking about um, if we can externalize some of the state from the memory to either disk or some other storage. So those are some of the options we are considering, but this is also a place where we'll be focusing going forward. And integrating with the YAN capability for opportunistic containers. So um, YAN opportunistic containers are the primary mechanism we use to drive up the utilization of our cluster and hence drive down the cost for our customers. And application master needs to have a deep understanding of how this uh, yeah, uh, opportunistic containers capability works to be able to use this optimally. And all the application masters running in the system need to be able to cooperatively use the excess capacity in the cluster while also not stomping on each other. Um, further, as Hitesh already talked about this, uh, adding reuse opportunistic containers, guaranteed containers, and locality in the same mix creates a matrix, a complicated matrix for scheduler to make decisions. So this is a place where we have some expertise from our experience in job manager in scope uh, in Cosmos. So we would be looking forward to bring those learnings here and be able to add this capability to Thais. And AM recovery. So um, this is, again, a very high priority ask for our customers. We'll have to plug in Graphene to the AM resiliency or recovery model that Thais already has. Further, we'll have to make sure uh, that the recovery is deterministic and reliable in the presence of dynamic behaviors when we dynamically change the um, DAG or we have some statistics-based optimizations, the recovery should still be deterministic and reliable. So with that, 
uh, I come to the conclusion of my talk here, of our talk here. Um, our journey with Thes has just started. Um, please, uh, we'll be filing the JIRAs for the things we have talked about in the coming weeks and months, and we'll be working with the community deeply on these things, and we invite you all to collaborate. Thank you. Um, any questions, comments? Sure. What's the current number of tasks that Tess handles now? So the question is, uh, what's the current number of tasks that Tess can handle? Um, so, so from what, uh, what we have heard from our friends at Yahoo, um, it's currently around 5,000. We have ourselves seen, or in some testing we did, um, go to 2,000, 3,000 concurrent tasks. Oh. 40K? Yeah. Okay, that sounds good. Okay. We should chat. Um, we should chat offline. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? Anything? Yes. So for us, uh, yeah. So the question is uh, that a Thes uh, can execute only one uh, task at a time in a container. Uh, is that a limitation that we currently care about, or we are doing going to do something about it? So I guess the answer is that for us particularly, we have not uh, had any issues with that particular limitations because our jobs uh, usually span thousands of uh, tasks and these tasks um, pretty much use the available capacity in the container well. And our philosophy to utilizing the excess capacity is through the opportunistic containers model. So I guess we have not looked into uh, being able to launch multiple tasks in a container, but we could look into that to be um, able to create less pressure on Yarn um, for acquiring containers. What is the major benefit of migrating to TAS? Do you see any performance improvement or cost efficiency improvement? I think, uh, like you mentioned earlier, Question. the yeah, so the question is, what's the major benefit of moving to Tay? So like I mentioned earlier, the code is something we are looking to future-proof, first and foremost. And there are critical features that we have not been able to add into the current code base. And one of the main ones, like you talked about, is JM resiliency or the ability to recover from failures. And that is something Tay already offers. So you want to leverage, and they both have very common roots. So for us, it's actually makes a lot more sense to leverage what the community has already done and then contribute back in areas where it may be not as good as what we have built internally. So it's really for future proofing and making sure we land some of these big features that we need. So you think is it, is it possible just take out that part of the uh, failover path and plug into your current job manager? Or you have to migrate it all step I think we'll have to use the, of course, we'll have to use the DAG execution capabilities that Taze has. We cannot just take the resiliency part uh, out from Taze and just plug it in or, or anything like that. Sure. So if you have moved it from Job Tracker to uh, Test Data Mister, uh, so if I remember correctly, Job Mister, or sorry, uh, Job Tracker can handle multiple DAGs at a time. Seems like the same process. Actually, I think Taze offers that capability as well, where you can have multiple DAGs running within the session. We don't currently use it, though that's something we could leverage in the future, but uh, not something we are using it. So uh, the job manager doesn't actually currently support multiple DAGs at the same time. Uh, either. So that is at parity with what Taze offers us in that case. 
so we run a single DAG per application master currently. And in Graphene on Thes, we would still run a single DAG in single application master. OK, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.